Deputy Assistant Secretary Melissa Brown, Your Excellencies, Distinguished Speakers, Ladies and Gentlemen, Good morning and a very warm welcome to this conference. As uh, MC has noted, this is jointly organized by my institute, the ICS Yusof Ishak Institute and the US Embassy here in Singapore. We are honored to have Secretary Brown and her team here with us today for a dialogue on the state of the US-Southeast Asia relationship and the avenues to advance US engagement within the region. In discussing the US-Southeast Asia relationship, the words used in the title of this conference, uh, namely stabilizing, empowering and enduring, serve as a useful starting point. It encapsulates the historical journey of US engagement with the region as a Pacific power. Over many decades, especially during the Cold War, the US has assumed the role of a regional security guarantor and a linchpin of the rules-based international order. This enduring commitment has empowered Southeast Asian economies, affording them the autonomy capacity and opportunities to pursue their own security and development objectives. Economically, the US commitment to free trade and its market openness have catalyzed the economic development of many countries, incentivizing them to undertake reforms and integrate into the global economy. Today, the US retains its position as a top foreign investor in the region its second largest trading partner and also a leader in both foundational and leading edge technologies. American capital, its domestic market and technologies developed in the, its labs as well as the startups remain indispensable to Southeast Asian economies. Looking ahead, the stabilizing, empowering, and enduring title also encapsulates our aspirations for the future of this vital partnership, particularly amidst the uncertainties, disruptions, and transformations that are unfolding globally. As we gather here today, conflicts continue to rage in Europe and the Middle East. The rules-based order and the commitment to free markets is unraveling. Yet more than ever, the development needs of nations around the world, whether for poverty reduction, climate change adaptation, green transition, or digital transformation, are urgently calling for collective global action. Southeast Asia has always flourished as an open and inclusive region, because the region itself needs to integrate diverse economies and value systems if it is to integrate at all. However, as the world gravitates towards greater protectionism and polarization, anxiety permeates the region and fundamental questions loom before us. Will US engagement with the region continue to be of stabilizing effect amidst its escalating strategic competition with China? Will it endure notwithstanding the rise of isolationism and political churns within the US itself. Can it still empower other nations if binary choices and tr are, thr and are thrust upon them and the pathway to prosperity through economic openness and globalization is no longer assured? On a more positive note, the challenges that both sides are facing also incentivize the US and Southeast Asia to collaborate more closely to address their shared security and development needs. It is in the US interest to support a strong and independent Southeast Asia. Similarly, Southeast Asia benefits from a strong and engaged America. This mutual interest underscores the importance of strengthening our partnership going forward. Considering the challenges and opportunities facing the US and Southeast Asia, today's conference with Des Brown is both timely and very significant. It provides us the opportunity to deepen our understanding 
of U.S. policies and activities in the region, including in emerging domains such as critical technologies and geoeconomic strategies. We are privileged to also have U.S. officials who are experts in these fields fly in from Washington to take part in this dialogue. This conference also features Southeast Asian experts who will critically assess and provide constructive feedback on U.S. policy. So this promises to be an engaging and insightful conversation that will help inform, we believe, uh, U.S. Southeast Asia policy. So on that note, I am really delighted to introduce Ms. Melissa Brown, Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of East Asia and Pacific Affairs, the U.S. State Department, where she leads on Southeast Asia policy. She oversees the offices of mainland and maritime Southeast Asia, as well as the Office of Multilateral Affairs. Ms. Brown's connection with Southeast Asia runs deep, with her many past postings across the region. Most recently, she has been the Shaje, the U.S. Embassy, a U.S. mission to uh, ASEAN, and before that, she served as the Counselor for Economic and Political Affairs, as well as acting DCM here in the U.S. Embassy in Singapore. There are few American officials who are as connected with Southeast Asia as she is, and has such a wealth of experience working with this region. I therefore believe she is ideally placed to shed light on the prospects of U.S. Southeast Asia uh, relations in 2024 and also the years to come. So, uh, Secretary Brown, if I may invite you to now uh, take the floor. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Director Choi, for the introduction as well as the very warm welcome. I would like to thank um, all the, the team here at ICS today for hosting this event and also for inviting me to speak. I think we already, with that introduction, have a lot of uh, food, food for thought. I'm truly honored to be back in, in Singapore. Um, as some of you know, I have a very long history, not only professionally, but also personally here in the region. I uh, recounted just earlier this week, it was 30 years ago where my parents sat me down as a teenager and let me know that I'd be moving to Jakarta from a small town in, in the United States in New Jersey. So that, that history, again, it, it, it's, it's more than professional, it's also personal. My very first posting in Bangkok was more than 20 years ago, and I've committed my diplomatic career since then to serving in and on Southeast Asia. Uh, as mentioned, I have a special connection here in Singapore. Not only did I, did I serve here and, and enjoy that time, but I also had my two children here in Singapore while posted elsewhere in the region. So certainly uh, good memories from that. I guess the question is why after 30 years, after that um, stressful family meeting where I learned I was moving to Jakarta, why after those 30 years do I still think um, and remain focused on Southeast Asia day in and day out? I'll, I'll talk a little bit more in detail, but I'll tell you I'm absolutely convinced that it's the most dynamic region with the brightest future and is absolutely vital to the interests of the United States. I'm going to structure my remarks today uh, around the theme of this conference, but I'm going to flip it upside down. So let me uh, do it in the opposite order. I'm going to start with enduring. It's an extremely fitting way to describe our wide and deep partnership with both Singapore and, and the region. And I want to begin by emphasizing something that's very important. Despite the fact that, again, there is so much going on in the world today, whether it's Russia's war on Ukraine or the conflict in the Middle East, the United States has an enduring commitment to East Asia, to the Pacific, to Southeast Asia, and of course, here to Singapore, one of our closest partners in the region. Notably, our enduring commitment has spanned decades and political administrations. 
Today, our partnership is as strong as ever and only continues to grow. We are constantly exploring new areas of cooperation, setting the bar even higher. Just last month in February, we completed the sixth US-Singapore Strategic Partnership Dialogue. During these discussions, we reaffirmed our wide-ranging partnership on defense and security, economic cooperation, critical and emerging technology, and also climate and energy. Our strong strategic partnership is underpinned by our shared values of good governance, of transparency, and of rule of law. Of course, our bilateral security cooperation with Singapore dates back to the 70s, but it really significantly deepened during the presidency of George H.W. Bush. It has not only continued, but it is strengthened throughout subsequent administrations, both Democrat and Republican. We've also had multiple high-level thematic dialogues that ensure the continuity and evolution of our engagement. We just recently established dialogues on critical and emerging technologies and on space and cyber, in addition to our longstanding dia uh, dialogue on counterproliferation. Our cooperation addresses global challenges, and it benefits more than just our two countries. For example, the US-Singapore Third Country Training Program has helped build capacity across the region for more than a decade. And in fact, just this week, we expended that cooperation to also include some of our partners in the Pacific Islands. It is that enduring commitment and deepening of institutionalized partnerships that can be seen throughout Southeast Asia. Our historic double upgrade of the US-Vietnam relationship to a comprehensive strategic partnership just last September is a testament to the pro positive trajectory of our relations in the region and the mutual desire for stronger engagement. Just in November, we also upgraded the US-Indonesia relationship to a comprehensive strategic partnership with President Chikoui's trip to Washington. It, these upgrades are just two examples, but they will allow us to take our partnership to the next level. I'm very delighted to see representatives from both Vietnam and Indonesia here today, um, both, both of whom I've had the pleasure of working with in the, in the past. Um, and I, of course, look forward to hearing their thoughts on, on all that we're uh, doing together. Just as Assistant Secretary said uh, just a few weeks ago during the Strategic Partnership Dialogue, I do want to thank Singapore for its continued leadership in the region. And that includes within ASEAN. And then, of course, thanks for partnering with us to tackle today's greatest challenges. To our Singapore colleagues who are here today, thank you for your continued close partnership. It really is a terrific example of an enduring partnership and also what we can accomplish and achieve when we work together. Let's move on. Let's, let's uh, next go to empowering. Simply put, the U.S. presence in this region has helped empower Southeast Asian countries to pursue their national interests and greater prosperity in a rules-based order. The strength and resilience of the U.S. economy is a key factor in allowing us to continue to have a strong economic presence across Southeast Asia. Our strong trade ties and foreign direct investment help empower countries in the region to prosper and progress. We are proud to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the U.S.-Singapore Free Trade Agreement just this year. Of course, those negotiations, they started under President Clinton, concluded under President Bush, and the FTA has remained a cornerstone of our economic partnership under President Obama, President Trump, and President Biden. Besides trade, you know we prioritize investment. And that investment, it encourages innovation, it strengthens competitiveness, it expands economic opportunities. It's an aspect that supports millions of jobs, but frankly, it's, it's often overlooked. In fact, I'll, I'll foot stamp this again, the United States is the largest source of foreign direct investment in Southeast Asia. And our trade rec reached a record $520 billion just last year. 
As a result, one million jobs were created throughout Southeast Asia. The United States also increased financing to promote the development and sustainable of sustainable infrastructure and regional connectivity, and announced an additional $600 million in new financing for private sector investments across Southeast Asia. This is in addition to the over 1 billion US dollars that we've committed through the Millennium Challenge Corporation in the past six years. Those programs, they directly focus on increasing financing for micro, small, and medium enterprises and also improve local infrastructure. Last year, IPEF partners reached agreements on three pillars that empower all of us to build clean economies, fair economies, and supply chains that are resilient, sustainable, diversified, secure, and inclusive. We launched the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment and the IPEF Investment Accelerator which all combine near-term infrastructure project work through public and mobilized private capital with medium-term efforts to identify and address barriers to investment. We look forward to empowering digital and technology cooperation in priority areas, including artificial intelligence, undersea cables, cloud computing, combating online scans, scams, cybersecurity, and capacity support for the ASEAN Digital Economic Framework Agreement. Most importantly, it is not the United States alone that's empowering our Southeast Asian countries' partners. We're doing this together with our friends and partners across the Indo-Pacific and beyond. We have increased the Quad's focus on economic policy issues over the past year with the Quad's leader-level working groups focused on infrastructure, climate, health security, and critical and emergency, emerging technologies. During the 2023 Quad Leaders Summit, we announced a new Quad Investors Network, nearly 2,000 Quad Infrastructure Fellowships, and the Quad Partnership for Cable Connectivity and Resilience. Also last year, we released the Japan-US-Mekong Power Partnership Action Plan. This plan will further increase our support for the Mekong's power sector development and integration with ASEAN. This effort is in addition to our strong support and long-term partnership for an ambitious, clean energy transition. Together with our partners from Japan, the European Union, United Kingdom and Canada, we also launched the multi-country Just Energy Transition Partnership, which empowers Indonesia and Vietnam with funding to achieve their ambitious clean power transition goals. The year 2023 was also a significant year for the US ASEAN relationship, and it built on the very strong mom momentum since the 2022 Special Leaders Summit that was hosted by President Biden in Washington, DC. Now, the hard work. We are working hard to implement the U.S. ASEAN Comprehensive Strategic Partnership, which supports the centrality of a strong and independent ASEAN and has enabled an even stronger U.S. engagement with ASEAN across the gamut of our co cooperation. As President Biden has said time and time again, the relationship between the United States and ASEAN is vital for the future of all our one billion people. Lastly, I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about our last theme, stabilizing. It is an essential word to consider when talking about the US and our overarching approach to the region. I also want to understand you, assure you that we understand that Asia's geography, right at the very center, Southeast Asia, the center of the world's most vibrant and dynamic region, but also with strong historical connections and other connections and overlapping footprints of many different countries. It's these complex ties that are a strength of Southeast Asia and ASEAN. And in order to ensure this stability, it is also important for the United States and Southeast Asia 
to work closely together. The United States will continue to vigorously pursue our strategic engagement in the Indo-Pacific region, which we view as absolutely central to the peace, prosperity, and the security of not only the United States, but of the world. As President Biden and multiple cabinet officials have said, the United States, our partners, and our allies have a shared positive vision for a region that is free and open, and increasingly connected, prosperous, secure, and resilient. And we can achieve this vision only if we work together. We were very proud to celebrate just a few weeks ago the Indo-Pacific Strategy's second anniversary. Over these past two years, we've made historic progress with our allies and partners to advance our common vision. We have promoted free and open societies, strengthened global democratic renewal, and pushed for accountability on human rights. We have been very vocal in our unwavering support for the people of Burma, of Myanmar, and for a return to the path to democracy. In the three years since the coup, we have provided nearly $360 million dollars in life-saving humanitarian assistance and dedicated $400 million to advance democracy, human rights, and justice. We have reaffirmed and strengthened our connections within the region and beyond the region. We hosted the, tr the historic Trilateral Leaders Summit at Camp David last year, which inaugurated a new era of the U.S.-Japan-Republic of Korea partnership. Through the Quad, we continue to deliver concrete benefits for the Indo-Pacific, starting with vaccines, but also to maritime awareness to scholarships with students. We have also built upon our long history of engagement in the Pacific, including with two historic summits for Pacific Island leaders at the White House and the opening of new embassies in the Solomon Islands and Tonga, with more to come, I hope. We have bolstered regional security by strengthening and modernizing our security alliances and partnerships, increasing joint military extra exercises, bolstering the ability of countries in the region to monitor their waters and cyberspace, and advancing the Australia-US-United States, or AUKUS pa partnership. We've also signed defense cooperation agreements with Indonesia and Papua New Guinea building on dec decades of bilateral and security cooperation and established mechanisms for real-time information sharing on DPRK missile threats with Japan and the Republic of Korea. Finally, we're taking steps to build an Indo-Pacific region that is resilient and resistant to the impacts of climate change and future pandemics. Together with our partners, we have dedicated funding to launch an initiative on disaster resilience, as well as an ocean and fisheries research vessel managed by the Pacific community. All of these actions have been taken to advance our vision for a free and open Indo-Pacific to ensure that no one country dominates either Southeast Asia or the wider Indo-Pacific, and to focus on finding ways to deepen connections connections with our allies, with our partners, and with our friends across the region. As you can see, there, there is a very wide range of activities, and I've only shared a few examples today of how the U.S. cooperates across Southeast Asia. It's, it's these webs of connections and the long-standing partnerships uh, between our governments, from working level to high-level officials, uh, between our businesses and between our people, whether they be students, tourists, those of us in the room. It's one of the strongest and most endure enduring forms of cooperation one can even imagine. The United States' engagement with countries in this region is guided by providing stability, ensuring a rules-based order, and empowering these countries to pursue their interests free of fear. Back to my intro, Southeast Asia's future continues to be bright, full of possibility, just as it was 30 years ago when I first stepped foot in this region. 
The United States aims to play the role of an indispensable partner to Singapore and to ASEAN well past the next 30 years. Thank you again for having me here today.